Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at our first town hall of 2016. My name is Jenny Parker, and I'm the Vice President of Communications. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Dr. Robert Gates and Barbara Starr to discuss Dr. Gates' new book, A Passion for Leadership, Lessons on Change and Reform from 50 Years in Public Service. First, some housekeeping notes. If you could take some time now to turn off or silence your cell phones. Also, we will be collecting questions from the audience. Please jot your question down on the paper provided and it will be collected. Barbara will get to as many questions as she can. Tonight's program will be followed by a book signing and sale. The book is available in our museum store downstairs. I also want to alert you to some very exciting town hall programs we have coming up. On February 1st, acclaimed scholar and judge Guido Calabrese will be here to discuss his new book on the future of law and economics. Then on February 8th, for a program titled Liberty's Nemesis, Dean Reuter of the Federalist Society and John Yu, former Justice Department official, along with former White House counsel C. Boyden Gray and Center for Equal Opportunity President Linda Chavez, will discuss why concentration of power in administrative agencies may be the greatest threat to our liberty today. On February 11th, please don't miss our conversation with top presidential historians Annette Gordon-Reed, Jeffrey Ward, and Sean Willens followed by light fair and a sneak peek at our very exciting new feature exhibit headed to the White House. This year's town hall lineup will also explore timely topics of immig immigration, policing, education reform, and others. The full schedule of town hall programs is available at constitutioncenter.org backslash debate. And I'm pleased to let you know that all of our fall 2015 town hall events are now available on iTunes and on our website. Finally, please note that the National Constitution Center is a nonpartisan private nonprofit and we rely on the support of our members to engage people of all ages in constitutional education. If you are not yet a member, please see Rebecca Bolden at the membership table outside the auditorium or visit constitutioncenter.org backslash membership for more information. Now on to tonight's guests. Dr. Robert Gates has served in numerous roles in the executive branch of the US government for nearly half a century, culminating as the 22nd Secretary of Defense. He is the only Secretary of Defense in US history to be asked to remain in that office by a newly elected president. Dr. Gates served under both President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama. On Gates' last day in office, President Barack Obama awarded him with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, our country's highest civilian honor. Dr. Gates is currently Chancellor of the College of William and Mary president of the Boy Scouts of America and currently serves on the board of directors of Starbucks. He has also served as the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and is the only career officer in the CIA's history to rise from an entry level employee to director. He has also served on several boards of directors and executive committees, including the American Council on Education, the Board of Directors at the National Association of State Universities and Land-Grant Colleges, and the National Executive Bo and Board of the Boy Scouts of America. He has also been president of the National Eagle Scout Association. Moderating tonight's discussion is Barbara Starr, an award-winning Pentagon correspondent for CNN. She joined CNN in 2001 from ABC News, where she worked as a producer covering the Pentagon and reporting on numerous programs, including Nightline, World News Tonight, World News Now, I'm sorry, that's World News This Morning, World News Now, ABC Radio, and abcnews.com. Previously, Starr was the Washington DC bureau chief for Jane's Defense Weekly, a London-based weekly news magazine, where for nine years she covered all aspects of national security, the intelligence community, defense, and military policy. 
During this time, she conducted numerous one-on-one -on -one interviews with current secretaries of defense and directors of central intelligence. She's traveled to the Balkans, the Persian Gulf, and NATO headquarters in Brussels. Before Jane's, Starr worked at Business Week, where she was a correspondent from 1979 to 1988. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Gates and Barbara Starr. Well, I, I think Dr. Gates and I are both absolutely delighted to see many, so many people here because I flew up from Washington earlier and uh, down in Washington it is full on apocalypse preparation. <laughs> Buddy called from the grocery store and said it was already hand to hand combat for, you know. <laughs> so, so this is great to see so many of you out here, thank you. Uh, as um, Dr. Gates and I hadn't seen each other in a while so we were reminiscing a minute ago and I do know him mainly as Secretary of Defense in covering the Pentagon. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but the press corps is in the building. We have working space. We have that uh, briefing room you may see on TV. Uh, Dr. Gates, as Secretary, knew he might encounter any of us in the hallway at any time. It's one of the last buildings in, in Washington where the press um, roams free. <laughs> and, um, the, the secretary was always so good about it. I, I've got to tell just a couple of very quick anecdotes. Um, so, and he may or may not remember, but one morning, you know, I was wandering the hallways looking for news, and I see him in a part of the building early in the morning where you would not expect a secretary of defense to be. He's walking with his security guy, and I'm like, what is he doing in this part of the building? What does this mean? Is something going on? So, of course, I couldn't resist. I'm like, Good morning, Mr. Secretary. What are you doing down in this part of the building? And he looks at me and he says, I was at the barber shop. Is that enough information for you? <laughs> yeah, but, it's, but it's revealing about the Pentagon that they wouldn't let me out of my office without well, somebody with me <laughs> in the conviction that I would get lost. Yes. <laughs> um, and I will tell one other quick anecdote because it immediately will get us to the question <coughs> of leadership. Um, I don't know how many of you, you know, ever got a chance to watch on TV, but we would have these press conferences, the secretary, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the briefing room, and they would come in and answer reporters' questions in a televised news conference. During secretary, the secretary's time, uh, the configuration was that he would sit at a table, except what began to develop is there were times when he wouldn't be at a table. There would just be a podium, a single podium, and we would peek in and look, and it was just the podium. And what you very quickly began to realize, when you peeked in the briefing room before the cameras went on, and it was just the single podium, he knows where I'm going. It meant that the secretary um, was about to fire somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and it happened several times. And then in the press corps, we privately nicknamed it the um, we're, we'll admit it, I think the nickname was the podium of death. <laughs> <laughs> and it took us several weeks, if not a couple of months, to uh, confess this to the secretary who had no problem with the nickname. <laughs> he, th <laughs> he thought it was okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want chairman, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mullen, to be uh, implicated in my <laughs> personnel decision. <laughs> so you, as a reporter, you open the door, you peek in, the two chairs at a table or the podium, and then you would scurry around and figure out who he's about to fire. Um, but it does get to, I think, a very interesting, very much the issue of leadership. And you know, the book is, you know, everybody says, oh, the book's interesting. This book really is, in part because of the timing. And this is what I wanted to ask him. This is a book about leadership and what it takes to be a good leader. Now, I suspect many of us in this audience, starting with me, we are employees somewhere in the world, and we have people who lead our organizations, and they may be employees of stockholders or employees of the federal, uh, you know, the cabinet. But when you wrote this book, did you think about the fact that you were actually writing about leadership as we are in an election cycle, and as voters, whatever your politics, we hear so much dialogue about people who think they can and should be the leader of the free world. 
with different qualifications for that. Is it just coincidence? Because I find this book very interesting in terms of a blueprint for maybe what it really does take to be president of the United States. Well, I think, I think what I, um, um, I think it, it's a manifestation of two things. First, um, first of all, let me thank you all for, also thank you for being here and thank Barbara for doing this. But it, <coughs> it is that um, the one thing we are seeing, particularly in the outsiders in this presidential race, uh, is that they have tapped into a deep well of real disgust on the part of many Americans with our elected leaders and their failure to get anything done, the polarization, the paralysis, and so on. But I think that there is another, another vein of discontent, and that's really the focus of this book, and that is that so many of our institutions, both in the public and private sector seem to be failing us and not serving the people they were created to serve nearly as well as they, as they should. And the litany of failures and scandals is, is endless. And it's as recent as yesterday's headlines or today's headlines about the water system in Flint. But uh, the IRS, the Secret Service, the, uh, the Veterans Affairs Department, um, the, the massive intelligence and law enforcement failure that led to 9-11 uh, itself, the failure of financial institutions and government regulatory bodies to prevent the financial crisis in 2008. The list just goes on and on, and the question that I wanted to address was I was able to reform and change each of the organizations that I led and what lessons <clears throat> did I learn over that 50 years that I think are applicable to both of these sources of frustration. And, and I think one of the things that I talk about in the book is what traits a leader should have and uh, as I, if I mention them quickly, um, you can measure the candidates against them. So people who have their egos under control, um, people who are transparent, who have integrity, who respect the people that work with them and for them, uh, that empower their subordinates, uh, that are willing to listen to other people and encourage candor uh, and criticism. Because I found all those things worked for me. I told, I told people at every place I worked, I'd rather be warned that I'm about to step on a landmine than step on it. And, but even if I've already made a decision and you think I've made a mistake, I want to know. And, and another characteristic, I think, that applies to every organization but it also applies to, uh, um, to the presidential race, was can, do they listen? What are the quality of people that they're prepared to surround themselves with? And, and I'll just make one further point, and that is if you look at the, at the, the greatest presidents, it seems to me they have in common that they fit a description that uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes offered about Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1933 when he said he had, when Holmes said that Roosevelt had a second-rate intellect but a first-rate temperament. And if you look at our greatest presidents, Washington, Lincoln, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower in my view, Reagan, they were self-confident enough to surround themselves with people they thought were smarter than they were, to listen to them and then integrate their views with their, uh, uh, their own judgment and their own experience. Unlike the founder of, uh, one of the founders of MGM, Samuel Goldwyn, who once told his staff, I want you to tell me exactly what you think, even if it costs you your job. <laughs> 
And yet, I mean, I think we all agree, as we're hearing the Secretary talk, this is a framework for being a member of the cabinet, for being a president, for being a university leader, as you have been. This is, this is, this, this goes across all sectors. But do you think that, how is leadership impacted these days by this, the hyper social media cycle? Because while you within the Pentagon or the CIA might have had some time to contemplate a problem and get the best advice and have the time to have that temperament, the news media is all over you in a, in a microsecond these days. And we see it, I think, in the presidential race. And we see an attention span by some candidates and by the media that seems increasingly short. Well, I think. Does that hurt uh, leadership? I think that it, I think leaders can deal with that. And, and what it requires is self-discipline. This is another characteristic that I describe, uh, that I talk about for leaders in, in the book. Uh, uh, self-discipline and restraint. One of the lines that I have in there is a favorite saying of mine, never miss a good chance to shut up. Uh, and, and the truth is, I think, I think a, a good leader, you know, if someone comes rushing up to them and says, how are you reacting to this bit of information? Uh, a good leader ought to have the discipline to say, well, first of all, I'm going to find out whether that's true or not. And then I may actually think about it a little bit before, before I decide uh, what we're going to do. So I, I think leaders allow themselves to be rushed into making uh, what end up often being imprudent statements or uh, rash statements. I, I think there is a difference between uh, being a candidate and being in office. Being in office does give you more of an opportunity to be disciplined. Whereas in a candidate, and it was sort of set up, I think, first really under the uh, in the Clinton campaign in, 19, um, in the 1992 election, sort of these war rooms where no allegation by anybody is ever allowed to go unanswered more than an hour. And, and sort of this constant trying to get ahead of the news cycle. So in a political campaign, it's probably a lot tougher. But, but you know, as part of this self-discipline, I also talk about, you know, people who yell and pound the desk and have temper tantrums and so on. I told the cadets at, the, at, the, at West Point in one of my talks with them, I said, you will, at some point in your career, you will all work for a jackass <laughs> because we all have. And I said, you just need to learn from that experience. And believe me, I learned as much from bad bosses as I did from good bosses. But I think, you know, I think to your point, the, the social media has, uh, uh, has had an effect. And in fact, I think the Defense Department is behind the power curve in communicating with its own people. Um, when President Obama first came in and I needed to hire a new assistant secretary for um, public affairs, they kept sending me these people who, in their 50s and late 40s, who had been consultants and public affairs specialists for companies and so on and so forth. And I finally told the head of presidential personnel and the White House chief of staff, I told Rahm Emanuel, I said, you, gotta, you guys don't understand. I have two million men and women in uniform, most of whom are between 18 and 25. I want you to send me somebody in their 20s from Google <laughs> to help me figure out how to communicate with these people. So in one respect, I think the Pentagon is, is, is slow and behind the power curve, just as our entire government is in trying to figure out how to respond to ISIS and so on and in a digital age. But, but I, I never, I, I complained in my last book, In Duty, about generals and admirals 
who had Facebook pages and tweets. And most of their, and, and I said, you know, the truth is, mostly what you're putting up there is your travel schedule and your, and your calendar of meetings and kind of what I did on my summer vacation stuff. And I said, frankly, I think it diminishes the mystique of command. You're too familiar. A little distance is important, particularly if you're going to be putting people in harm's way. I have to say I didn't make much progress. Let me, um, by the way, take a minute. I think there are cards circulating around the room. <coughs> uh, somebody will be by to pick them up and drop them in front of me. And uh, as soon as we get some, you know, we'll start going to audience questions because I know the secretary would much rather have a conversation with you than me. He, me, he already knows. Um, so um, we'll, we'll get some questions going within the next couple, couple of minutes. I want to ask, though, again, from the standpoint, let me reverse it. We're employees. You have a boss that you think is, is bad. Uh, what do you do? You just put your shoulder to the wheel and, and go on? Um, you say, I mean, what have you learned from bad bosses or bosses you didn't agree with? Well, As a young man, even. What yeah. did, when I was a fairly junior analyst at CIA, we got a new branch chief. And uh, there were, I think, 10 of us in the branch. And, um, and he was a real hard case. And we, we all had already established a pretty good reputation uh, several levels above us for the work we were doing. We were, were all working on Soviet foreign policy. And, and, and I write in the book about this, how he gave all of us a bad um, eva annual evaluation. And, and several of us went over his head to say, this is not fair. This is not an accurate reflection of the performance that then you know it's not because you know our work. And they were non-committal, but in something I write in the book was rarer than I would have ever believed. He was gone in about three or four months because smart people, the smart leaders, absolutely do not want to lose talented staff because of a toxic boss. And so depending on where you are in the institution and if you've had the opportunity, you know, if you're a brand new employee, frankly, you're just going to have to suck it up and live with it for a while. But if you've been there for a while and you've established a reputation and people above your immediate supervisor know that you are a great performer, then you have the opportunity to go around and say, you know, this guy is going to drive good people away. You need to be watching him or her very closely. Um, and if you're, if if the if the if the bad boss is the very top person in the organization, that's the hardest of all. And if it's a public corporation, or if it's a major governmental organization then in all honesty, the best way to deal with a toxic boss is to figure out a way to let the news media know that you've got a toxic <laughs> boss. <coughs> I just want to point out he never, ever leaked anything to me, <laughs> ever. Um, and I'll take some cards, you guys, of questions as soon as uh, they come this way. Um, you have talked in the past, I know, about leadership in the context, to be quite blunt, of, of the jobs you have had and the presidents you have served, and to follow on the point we're talking about, your frustration, which I think we all might have in the workplace occasionally, uh, though not on your level, of being micromanaged. And can you talk a little bit about, take us inside this last administration, President Obama, the National Security Council, um, and the frustration that you've already publicly talked about in terms of this framework of leadership versus micromanagement. So one of the principles that I talk about in the book uh, about leadership is the importance of 
choosing good subordinates, empowering them to do the job, holding them accountable, but not micromanaging them. I, as, I, as I like to say, as I say in the book, if, if the leader won't take his hands off the steering wheel, then he can't hold the person that he's assigned the job responsible for taking the project into a ditch. And, and so I think the really important thing is to, is to be willing to delegate and then empower people, and empowering them in lots of different ways, and then holding them accountable. And part of the, pro part of the problem in Washington is that accountability has become synonymous with blame. And accountability really works both ways. If somebody is, if somebody is given a task and succeeds, they ought to be held accountable and rewarded for it. Just as if they fail, they should be held accountable and, and suffer the consequences. So one of the problems that, that I had in the Obama administration was uh, the problem of micromanagement, and particularly of military uh, activities. Or in, I would say in my time in the Pentagon, attempted micromanagement, because I blocked it. He had the podium. Uh, <laughs> I also had the advantage that everybody knew that I wanted nothing more than to get the hell out of there. And so it gave me a great advantage in Washington. Oh, I forgot to tell you. He kept a countdown clock in his office. <laughs> How many days he had left before he could go? Actually, days, minutes, yes. hours, minutes, and seconds. <laughs> but, but the, uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I think that uh, when I was at a, at a special operations command center in Afghanistan, I saw a direct line to a White House staffer or an NSC staffer. It was a phone and, communications line, right? Yeah. Right. And I, I called that. the commander over and I said, I want that line ripped out and I want it ripped out while I'm standing here watching. And if the White House ever calls you again, you tell them you're not authorized to speak to them, refer them to me, and oh, by the way, tell them I told them to go to hell. <laughs> and I sent word to all of the major commanders with exactly that same message. Because I worked on the NSC in the White House under four different presidents, under the three, the three most powerful national security advisors in American history. Henry Kissinger, Spignev Brzezinski, and Brent Scowcroft. And if I had tried to call a four-star general as an NSC staffer, I'd have been fired within the hour by any of those men. And, and it was a level of micromanagement. And I'll give you an example. This is hypothetical. This isn't hypothetical. This is inferential on my part about a current event where I can see the foot the fingerprints of White House micromanagement all over it. And that was the freedom of navigation exercise around one of the Chinese artificial islands in the South China Sea. First, my guess is that the Pentagon was pressing to do one of those freedom of navigation, um, uh, steaming by one of these islands within the so-called 12-mile limit for months before the White House finally agreed to it. But then they did a number of things in terms of turning off radars on the ship and so on that, in, that instead of it being a freedom of navigation exercise, asserting that nobody had, those were not anybody's territorial waters, it became an innocent passage, um, which is like when the Chinese ships go through the Aleutians and so on, and if there was no, no um, uh, bad intent and so on, it's called innocent passage. And I can just see the White House changing the rules of engagement and what that ship had to do so that it was more ambiguous than a freedom of navigation exercise. And I think you're seeing the same kind of micromanagement in terms of the careful calibration of whether we have <coughs> 50 or 60 or 65 special operators 
uh, on the ground in Iraq fighting ISIS or whether we have 100 or whatever. So this kind of micromanagement uh, is characteristic of this White House. I would say it was, I also believe that kind of micromanagement was responsible for the failure of the rollout of the Obamacare website uh, a couple of years ago. They tried to centralize the implementation of that thing in the White House rather than in the Department of Health and Human Services where there would have been technical uh, capability to do it right. So uh, this is a problem. And I'll just give you a, a final factoid on this. The National Security Council staff under the four presidents I worked for, uh, that would have been Nixon, Ford, Carter, and first Bush, numbered about 50 or 60 people. The National Security Council staff in this administration is 450 people. Okay. <laughs> we have some really terrific questions from the audience, so let's kind of just go through them and get as many in <coughs> as we can. And I think this first one, very short, but right to the point. Can good leadership be taught? I think that um, I try to differentiate in the book between leadership and management. Management involves specific skills, logistics, finance, human relations, uh, all those different components that are where talent and skill is needed to organize and run a, an organization, whether it's the military or a, a business. I think leadership, le my dictionary defines leadership as one who shows the way. It's, it's a leader is somebody who is looking to the future. And I think leadership, as opposed to management, is more about the heart than the head. Dwight Eisenhower wrote his son in 1943, and this is in the book, about how, um, about the leadership, uh, the qualities of leadership, and he talks about dedication and sincerity, fairness and good cheer. Those are not qualities taught in school. Character and integrity are not taught in school. You can hone some of these capabilities, but if you don't like people, if you don't respect people, if you, are un if you think you're better than other people, if you don't treat pe other people with dignity, in my view, you cannot be a successful leader. And those are things that are more about the heart than about the head. So when you look at the list of presidential candidates right now, what were what worries you? I mean, it... <laughs> well, I, I was asked on Morning Joe the other morning if I saw any of the if any of the candidate if I saw any candidates uh, or how many of the candidates I thought had the characteristics of leadership that I had been describing, and I said I don't see any. I've decided in retrospect that was probably too harsh. There are probably two or three. <laughs> and no, I'm not going to name them. <laughs> <coughs> but it is a, it's a troubling thought. Um, and one of the questions sort of gets right to that. He, this uh, audience member asks, given your ability to reform bureaucracies, what advice would you give to the next president of the United States? Let's broaden that out on reforming bureaucracies, on leadership, on being in fact, the leader of the free world? Well, my advice would be to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, um, I think one of, the, one of the messages that I would um, give to a new president is, goes back to something I said earlier. Um, be very careful about who you choose as your subordinates because you need to empower them, you need to delegate authority, and then hold them accountable. And, and, and the second piece of that is, and I've seen this repeatedly, 
you need to think about them as a team. When President Bush, uh, President Obama, President elect Obama and I had our secret meeting in the firehouse at Reagan Airport uh, to see whether I would agree to work for him. Um, one of the first questions I asked him is, Who's the rest, what's the rest of the team look like? Who are you considering for other jobs? Because most of my career, the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense weren't on speaking terms. And in some cases, they really hated each other. And it happened more often than not. And often there was that kind of feeling between the National Security Advisor and the Director of Central Intelligence and so on and so forth. And so the question is, can you put together a team that can disagree with each other and remain a team and respect each other and disagree and give you good advice? And, and I would say that <coughs> the president that did that best in my view, uh, was the first President Bush. And so of, of his major team, of his principal players, uh, Jim Baker and Dick Cheney, as, who was Secretary of Defense, and Scowcroft as National Security Advisor, Colin Powell as Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, I was Deputy National Security Advisor, and so on. We had a lot of disagreements, but it was always congenial because we knew President Bush insisted on that, and that anybody that went out and leaked on somebody else or trashed somebody else was not going to be long in his job. So, Which is a concept that works on several levels. It works in the boardroom, right? Absolutely. This team, you know, Absolutely. It, it works probably for many of us in our and, own and, jobs. And I'll tell you, the president, the president who wants consensus is going to be very sorry for it. Uh, somebody once described consensus as everyone uh, agreeing collectively on something to which they all disagree individually. <laughs> and, and one of the things that I talk about in here is the use of task forces in various groups. And I say, if you put a premium on consensus, you will be the loser because consensus always goes to the least common denominator. And you will almost certainly not have a bold enough proposal if you've insisted on consensus. When he, was, <coughs> when he was at the Pentagon, one of the very, two of the very bold things, but looking back in retrospect, it were things that had to get done that the secretary did. His response to the scandal that you may recall at Walter Reed when we learned that our nation's wounded veterans were not being appropriately taken care of. Uh, if you were in the Army and involved in that, you really didn't want to be explaining that to the Secretary. You wanted to be fixing it, not standing up there explaining it. You wanted to be already fixing it, or he would not be very happy with you. And you did not want to be telling the press that it was all the fault of a couple of NCOs not doing their job. Yeah. So that was, that was one, and we're going to come to a question here, that was one leadership moment that I think the news media remembers because the secretary moved extremely quickly on that. And the other one, um, you may recall, in the years of combat, <coughs> it got to the point where dozens and then hundreds of young troops were dying in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan due to IEDs, improvised explosive devices, and the secretary looked around and wondered why the Pentagon was not building advanced armored vehicles known as MRAPs that were specifically designed to resist the blast of a roadside bomb. Two decisions that the secretary made, and the question I have, and he can explain those to you, the question I have here is, is though, is what is the most difficult decision you had to make professionally and why? I suspect the two that I just laid out were not difficult. They were just, this is going to get fixed. The, most, the most, difficult most difficult decisions, really, I would put in two categories. The most difficult decision I had to make was made every Friday. And that was the deployment orders book. 
And that was when I decided each week what units would be sent uh, to Iraq and Afghanistan, knowing that I was sending all those young people in harm's way. The toughest single decision I think I made was actually one of the earliest, and that was to extend the tours of troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to 15 months from a year. A year was already a really hard tour on the troops and on their families. And, but because of the Iraq surge, we didn't have enough troops to maintain the level of troop that we needed and the president had authorized without either cutting their time at home or extending their time in the theater. And when I made the decision, and it was the recommendation of the Army and the other services that I do it, but when I did it, I knew that was going to be very hard on the troops and especially on their families. As a, as a young captain in my office told me, he said, sir, the thing you need to understand is that brings, into, brings, it, brings to life the, the law of the twos. You miss two anniversaries, two Christmases, two birthdays, et cetera, two Thanksgivings. And that's tough on a family. And I, I will always believe, I have no statistical basis for it, and I've never seen any, but I will always believe in my heart that those long tours uh, contributed to uh, an increase in post-traumatic stress. Yeah, I remember that because so many were very, very close to ending their tours. They were going to be coming home. They were, they were at the end of the year, their year over there. Some were on their way out and got turned around. Yeah. Pretty, t you know, tough business, very tough business. Um, but on a lighter note, let's talk about Vladimir Putin. The secretary, <laughs> the secretary, CIA director, all of his job. He has a long, long history of direct knowledge of Soviet and Russian leaders. So I just want to know this. So, but, you know, it's my question. So what is the deal with Putin? I mean, is he? <laughs> Seriously, you've read all the stuff. You know guys who know guys. <laughs> so <coughs> tell us about him and how he comes out of that era of KGB Soviet leadership. I mean, does the KGB essentially still live in Vladimir Putin? Is, you know, what's Absolutely. The, what's the deal? The, um, so President Bush famously said after meeting with Putin that uh, he had looked into Putin's eyes and seen his soul. Uh, I came back from my first meeting with Putin in February of 2007, and I told President Bush I'd looked into Putin's eyes and I'd seen a stone-cold killer. Now, maybe it's the old CIA KGB thing, and I found a way to remind him that he'd been a sort of... Was he nice to you, or did he just, like, stare actually, we had Actually, we had kind of an interesting relationship because of this. I think we spoke more candidly to each other. He knew I wasn't a diplomat, and I sure as hell knew he wasn't. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I would tell people, because I'd be very blunt in my conversations with foreign leaders, and I'd say, look, if I'd wanted to be a diplomat, I'd have gone to the State Department, not CIA. And, and um, one time Putin pushed a piece, of, we were talking about Iranian, the range, uh, ranges of Iranian missiles, and and because it all had to do with our missile defense in Europe and so on. And he, showed, he pushed a map across the, the uh, uh, table at me uh, showing, um, that showed the range arcs of Iranian missiles. And it was all wrong. And it was the, they were all very, they were way too short. But it was also amazingly crude. It was like some high school kid had put it together using a compass with colored pencils. And and I, and I just pushed it back across the table. He said, this is the best judgment of our intelligence services. And I pushed it back across the table. And I said, you need a new intelligence service. <laughs> um, I think Putin um, is, Putin is all about lost power and lost glory 
and lost empire. He's not delusional, he's not crazy, he's not any of those things. What he, what people, I think, just a sentence or two of background. I think we in the West seriously underestimated the magnitude of Russia's humiliation with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Because it was not just the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was the collapse of the Russian Empire. And Russia's borders today are roughly what they were before Catherine the Great. No Central Asia, no Ukraine, and so on. And Putin feels this to the marrow of his bones. And so he, he basically has two strategies. The first strategy is to reassert Russia's role in the world as a great power, to make Russia be taken seriously again and whether it's threats of nuclear, using nuclear force, or deploying military capabilities, or warships, or whatever, uh, or diplomatic initiatives, this explains his activism in Syria. He is a determined that Russia from now on, unlike the 1990s, if there's any international issue, Russia will be at the table, and in some cases, like Syria, he intends for Russia to be in the chair. The second piece of it is as old as the Russian Empire, and that is to reestablish a buffer of either friendly or frozen conflict states on the periphery of Russia as a protection. So he doesn't care whether you've basically dismembered a country like um, uh, Georgia or uh, Ukraine. He is determined that, that Russia's interests on its periphery will be protected, and that's one of the reasons why for obvious reasons, the Baltic states and others continue to worry. So these are his two main themes. Um, and, and I think that uh, he's not a sentimentalist. If he finds another Syrian who will be a close friend of Russia, buy weapons from Russia, uh, allow the Russians to keep their naval base at Tartus uh, near Latakia, um, he'll dump Assad in a heartbeat. So, so is, there, is there any doubt in your mind that he would and maybe has already killed some of his opponents? Oh, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Uh, I, I think this report that has come out in the news today about from the uh, United Kingdom, uh, putting the blame squarely on him for the poisoning of Letjenenko, I think, I think is completely credible. He told the oligarchs when he first took power he got them all in the room. This is literally true. Got all the oligarchs in a room, and he said, here's the deal. I know every one of you stole everything you have, and I know how you stole it, and here's the deal. If you stay out of politics and stay out of my way, you can keep it. If you get in my way or get into politics, you will pay a heavy price. And so you had Kordakovsky in a Siberian prison for years. You have Berezovsky in exile in Moscow and eventually dying. So this, this is a very cold, calculating guy. And uh, kind of a different form of leadership. It's a different form <laughs> of leadership. So one of the questions that's interesting here, it says, who was the most intelligent person you served under? but maybe also the most intelligent person you might have interacted with who may not be a good guy. Who may not be a good guy. So who's a, you know, does somebody, is there an aha moment out there in your, you know, where you go, huh, that's. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, I think anybody who's worked for Kissinger and Brzezinski and Scowcroft has to put them pretty, pretty high on, on a list of incredibly intelligent people. And, and not only intelligent, but thoughtful and, and insightful. Um, let, me do, let me ask you something else. Uh, again, we're just going to talk about current events for a minute here. We're, we're going to wrap up in about <coughs> 10. I think many of us look at ISIS. We look at the threat to the homeland, and we wonder, are we at, in lone wolves, the so-called lone wolves, so inspired attacks, are, are we at the point where we have to accept the notion that America cannot completely be kept safe? 
do we have to accept in our society now that no leader, you know, they all promise in an election, <coughs> but that the reality is we may be living in a world that is very different, very different since 9-11. Well, I mean, one of the things that where our world has been different since World War II is before World War II, there was war and no war. Since World War II, we have had, we have lived in a gray area where we have had sort of wars, we have had uh, wars with surrogates, we have had wars like Vietnam that ended up inconclusively, or in Vietnam's case, frankly, as a loss, but wars like Iraq and Afghanistan that have ended up inconclusively. Um, and, and I think that, I think describing what, what we have been doing since 9-11 as a war on terrorism really was a mistake. Because terrorism is a technique. It's not, it's not an identifiable enemy. And terrorism has been with us forever. It's the enemy, it, it is the tool of the weak against the strong. And after all, people forget that uh, William McKinley was killed by a terrorist. People forget World War I was sparked by the act of a terrorist. Uh, Russian, uh, Alexander III of Russia was killed by a terrorist. The Empress of Austria was killed by a terrorist. So the latter quarter of the 19th century saw a lot of terrorism aimed mainly at heads of state or important government officials, and especially in Russia. So I think we are at a point where you cannot any more eliminate the threat of terrorism than you can eliminate crime or a public health problem. What your objective has to be is to contain it and keep it to a low enough level that it does not disrupt people's daily lives. It's not on their minds every single day. And it does not cause us to change our values uh, as a country and, and the rights and, and privacy and civil liberties that we have as a country. I think we have the capability to do that. Uh, and and you, there is a need to keep this in perspective. Um, 30,000 people, or I forget what the figures are, but it's something like 30,000 people a year uh, are killed, in this country, are killed by guns. And the total number of people killed by terrorists in the last year is about 50. Now, that's a big problem, and particularly because they're lone wolves, whether it's in the Boston Marathon or what happened in San Bernardino or elsewhere. And so we clearly are going to have to do better at getting into neighborhoods and getting into communities, particularly where uh, in Islamic communities in this country, and getting community leaders and parents attuned to their children and willing to speak up if their children are, being, are alienated and and if their children are susceptible to being radicalized online. We have to be smarter about how we counter this online. So there are a lot of things I think we can do more of, but, but I think that any leader, and this is frankly where I just am so dismayed with all of the candidates, because no matter what national security issue they're talking about, they're, they're either making totally unrealistic or totally uninformed or uh, totally dishonest promises to the American people. But we do need to do more. We do need to do a better job of vetting people who are coming here. But, but we also need to keep this, this threat in perspective here at home. Without changing who we are. Without as a changing nation, who we are. Nation. Let's have, I'm gonna, uh, I have two last questions for you here. What advice would you give to a young person interested in a career in public service leadership? What advice do you have for young people? 
Well, first of all, I would encourage them to do it. Um, I think that I think that the the younger generation today uh, is not like my generation or the generation before me, where you would look at a single job or a single organization and say, "I want to make my career there. I want to spend." 30 or 40 years working for that, that one organization. So if I were a young person today, I, I think the advice I would give is go into public service and in your first job, stay long enough to establish a reputation for, capable, for being capable and competent and a hard worker and so on. And then if, if you feel stifled, in one place, don't withdraw from public service because you're stifled, and then and go someplace else, and go to the private sector necessarily. But go to another agency, go to another part of the same organization. Don't don't ever feel like you're trapped in in one place. When I was, I'd been at the agency six years when I was first offered a job at the National Security Council by Kissinger, and. My bosses, <coughs> excuse me. My bosses at CIA told me there probably wouldn't be a job for me when I came when I wanted to come back. <laughs> Interestingly enough, most of those people were still at the agency when I became director. <laughs> <laughs> I never bothered them, <coughs> but. But I think you have, to, you have to be willing to take risks. You have to have a certain sense of adventure. Um, you know, opportunity will knock, but it won't knock the door down. <coughs> and then the other thing I would say is nowadays, you know, a, a lot of really great public servants move back and forth between the public and the private sector. And don't rule that out either, because you'll learn a lot in the private sector that will make you more effective in the public sector, and vice versa, to tell you the truth. And the other piece of it, I would say, is if you're interested in public service and you end up not in public service as a career, public service can still be a part of your life. There are an awful lot of people I know in the private sector who dedicate a lot of their time and their energy to public service in one way or another. So there are a lot of ways that you can do public service without saying, I'm going to go to work for CIA for 40 years, or I'm going to go to work for the Agency for International Development for 30 years, or something like that. But I think you need to be, you need, once you've established your reputation, uh, you need to be a risk taker because that's the only way you're going to get some really different experiences. And the last question, we have this two, same question really, maybe two or three cards here. So I'll just read it to you. Why haven't you run for president and have you ever thought about it <laughs> as he's swallowing water? <laughs> Lucky I didn't choke that. Um, well, somebody asked me. Really, right here. Somebody, somebody asked me. Somebody asked me in the last day or two if it was too late for me to run for president, <laughs> and my reaction was, "It's always been too late for me to run for president." No, you know, I think I'd be a terrible politician. Um, for one thing, I just am terrible at remembering names. <laughs> uh, but, but I think. Uh, in some ways, I'm probably too blunt. Uh, maybe, maybe that's what people are actually looking for now, is sort of people being straightforward about things. But I've just, I've never even contemplated it. And uh, uh, I, I will tell you one other aspect of it, just on a very personal level. I have never had a problem going out and asking people for money for the Boy Scouts or for Texas A&M or for the College of William & Mary. I would find it humiliating beyond words to go out and ask for money for myself. And 
And in that respect, I think almost everybody in uh, politics has a missing gene. <laughs> and and uh, I, think, I think the thing that I would like to see a lot more of uh, on the part of public officials and especially elect elected officials is humility. I suspect there's a lot of people agree agree with you on that point. Um, and I think what you can take away from this evening is you will begin to see here tonight one of the reasons many members of the Washington Press Corps and the Pentagon Press Corps in particular, which I'm a member of, um, miss Secretary Gates. We really do. So first of all, sir, thank you. Thank you. A passion for leadership. I believe the secretary is going to do some book signings downstairs. I am. I am. Um, and if you come back to the Pentagon, swing by the press room. <laughs> <laughs> We're always there. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you all, all much. so much for coming tonight. And everybody, you know, have a safe weekend tucked inside from the apocalyptic <laughs> snow. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank I'll you. get some time.